Hey, Honors Chemistry. I wanted to help us out and provide a video on the Unit 6 review so you had some extra resources for studying for your test this week. So I'm going to kind of try and go through all of them or most of them and then you'll have this and we're going to do some more in class the day before the test. So recall your representation of the atoms in the sticky tape activity. Below is a pair of tapes before they have been pulled apart. Explain why they would not exert a force or either attractive or repulsive on one another. What they mean here is they would not be attracted or repelled. And it kind of says that right here. Okay, well, if we remember, we represented these little dots as like electrons. And both of these have an equal number of electrons. All right, so if they have, and I mean, each of these atoms have three circles, and we're going to call those little circles electrons. They have an equal number of electrons, so there's not going to be an attraction or repulsion. Okay, and then to show when you'll have an attraction or repulsion, let's look at number two. If I ripped those two pieces of tape, remember, if I had those two pieces of tape separately, they wouldn't be attracted to each other. The moment I ripped them apart, they started to become attracted to each other, and it's because the top tape would lose some electrons to the bottom tape. So if I just said one, 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 and then I added two to the bottom, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. This top tape lost two electrons, and this bottom tape gained two electrons. If it lost two electrons, it becomes positive charge, and if it gained electrons, it becomes negative. Remember, if I lose electrons, I'm losing negative charge, and I'm becoming positive. If I gain electrons, I gain negative charge, and I become negative. Okay, and by the way, this is after we've done some research on, research on some things. We're jumping way ahead that these particles that are inside this piece of tape, they're negatively charged particles, and we called them later on electrons. So we're jumping to conclusions here. But anyways, our top tape would be positive, our bottom tape would be negative, and we know that opposites attract. So positive will pull to the negative, okay? So that's what happens when we rip the two pieces of tape apart. The bottom tape rips off some electrons from the top tape, and the top tape has less negative charge, and now they become attracted to each other because of the difference in the charge. Okay? Now it says, what are some hypotheses that come from the ripping of the two tapes only? Okay, so we have to be careful. All right, so the ripping of the two tapes only. So one thing is that some charged particles were transferred. That's something that we kind of can make a guess or inference from just the tapes alone because things become positive and negative because we know positive and negative are attracted to each other, all right? We know then, since this is tape, atoms carry some electrical charge because things end up being attracted or repelled to each other. The charged particles are mobile meaning they move. And how do we know they move? Well, if you remember one of um, our explanations coming from actually Kennedy Clark, she said when these two pieces of tape came into contact with each other, the bottom tape ripped off something from the top tape. It ripped off some form of matter that was smaller, but we didn't know what it was yet. 
And we knew that charge had to have been transferred because before they weren't attracted, but after I put them together and ripped them apart, they became attracted. So something must have transferred. And then because of that transfer, those particles must have been mobile. One big thing that you need to know is what we did not know is that it was a negative charge. So did not know it was negative. So this is a big hint hint. We didn't know it was negative. We knew it was electric, like there was electrical, there was some sort of static, All right? But we didn't know it was negative. That only, we only figured out it was negative from in our next question, the cathode ray experiment. So describe how J.J. Thompson concluded that the mobile charged particle in the atom had a negative charge. Well, if you remember that cathode ray tube, okay, there was like a positive plate and a negative plate. And when he put the ray in there, the ray went towards the negative plate. So the ray went towards, sorry, the ray went towards the positive plate, towards positive plate. That meant that it had, it had negative charge, and then therefore, atom contained negative charge. Okay? So, we did not get the negative charge from the pulling of the tape. We got electrical charge, we knew there was some type of charge, we didn't know what it was, it could have been positive or negative, I didn't know. There was some type of charge that was transferred, and it was mobile, so if it's saying transferred and mobile, it's the same thing. We did not know it was negative until we had to look at the cathode ray experiment, okay? J.J. Thompson discovered that negative charge and we called it an electron. All right, now jumping a bit more, a solution of salt conducts electricity. A solution of sugar does not explain. So in a salt, we have ions. So like NaCl has Na positive one and Cl negative one. In sugar, there are no ions and the molecules do not touch. Do not touch. Whereas we know in NaCl, the ions touch. Okay, so the reasons why the ionic salt conducts electricity is because between the positive and the negative, electrons are able to flow, right? That is why a solution of salt conducts electricity because electrons are able to flow between positive and negative. Because we know electrons are negative, they're attracted to positive, and it kind of goes back and forth. It allows for that flow of electrons, or ions allow for the flow of electrons, okay? And as we saw in a class with molecular ionic and atomic solids, the ionic solids are all touching, and then when they dissolve, they become the ions, which are able to freely move. So the ions allow for the free movement of electrons. That's huge, and that is the reason why salt dissolved conduct electricity. Sugar, which is a molecular compound, it has no ions, the molecules do not touch, and it does not allow for the flow of electrons. So that's our big thing here between why salt conducts electricity and sugar does not. Salt allows for the flow of electrons and we know that flow of electrons is electricity. Molecules do not do that. Okay? All right. So here's the next question. Below left is a 2D array that represents an ionic lattice. At right is a 2D array that represents a molecular solid. In what ways are they similar? In what ways are they different? Right, so contains ions, contains molecules, all touching 
not touching or connected, all touching or connected, organized, not organized. All right, if you remember the crystal, crystal has a repeating pattern. All right, maybe something that they have in common, two or more elements. Two or more elements. Right, so if I had a molecular solid, it could be CO2. And if I had an ionic solid, it'd be NaCl. Two elements, two elements. That could be something that they have in common. Okay. Um, something else that they have in common, you could say particles are close together. Are close together. That could be something they have in common because it's a solid. They are close together. The closest together. Okay. All right. Next question. How do you decide how many ions of each type combine to form an ionic compound? This question is asking how do you write formulas, basically. So, for example, if I had sodium and phosphorus, and these two were going to combine to form the compound sodium phosphide, how do I know how many of each, oops, phosphide, how do I know how many of each I need? Well, sodium, if you go to the periodic table, sodium has a charge of positive one. Phosphorus will form a charge of negative three. So sodium is positive one. Phosphorus will form a charge of negative three. To figure out how many each, how many of each, this is the answer. We want the sum of the charges to equal zero. So the only way this happens is uh, if I had, let's see, between one and three, a least common factor is three. This will only happen if I had three sodiums and one phosphorus. And so I would write this as Na3P, sodium phosphide. Okay, that is how you decide how many ions. We want the charges to equal zero, or we call that neutral. Okay, all right, next question. Why do we use the term formula unit rather than molecule when we refer to the simplest repeating unit of an ionic solid? And I say, think about the formula unit for sodium chloride written as NaCl and how the molecular compounds can be written like S2O4. Well, NaCl, we want the simplest ratio. Right? If I had Na6Cl6, this would be incorrect. And that's because if I look up here, the ionic solid repeats. So it's like NaCl, NaCl, NaCl. Okay? That repeats. For something like S2O4, that could be the smallest molecule. That's a molecule. Ions are broken apart. Broken apart. Like Na plus one and Cl minus one. The molecules cannot break apart. So my repeating would be like this. S2O4, S2O4, S2O4. Those would be one molecule, then another molecule, then another molecule, okay? And so look about up here, CO2, 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 CO2. This could easily be S2O4, 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 S2O4. That's just repeating, that's, that's how the molecule repeats, right? So that would be the smallest unit, would be that molecule. SO2 would be a completely different molecule, all right? So that is the big reason why we write ionic compounds in the simplest form because they are, are broken apart into its individual ions and they repeat in patterns. Okay? And then the last big question is how many ions are formed when solid sodium sulfate dissolves? All right, so this is a big deal here. And you did this in one of your practice sets. 
We have to be careful. And this is sodium sulfate. There are three symbols here. So this is has a polyatomic ion. And we know that Na is sodium. That means if I look it up, SO4 is sulfate. Okay? Now, sodium is Na positive 1. But how many sodiums are found in this compound? Two of them. Na plus 1, Na plus 1. How many sulfates are found in this compound? Just one. Here are all my ions. How many ions dissolved? Three ions. There are two NAs and one SO4. Okay? This is like when I made you do that practice set for the mixed practice and I asked you to identify the different ions. If I were to quickly do another one, let's say I had something like Fe and then PO4. What are the ions that are here? Again, three symbols, so there must be a polyatomic ion. I would have Fe3 plus and PO4 3 minus. This is iron 3 phosphate. And phosphate has a, a charge of negative 3. So this would have two ions that dissolve the Fe3 plus and the phosphate 3 minus. Remember and be careful, polyatomic ions are one whole ion, so you gotta be careful. They're considered as one ion, and then these sodium ions are considered each as an ion. So that is what dissolves, okay? All right, so I'm gonna stop here for our video and our answer key for the review sheet. Hopefully this was kind of like a crash help on a lot of the material that we found in this unit. You're gonna be on your own for answering questions 11 through 15 in your review sheet, right? It says, apart from making life difficult, why do chemists refer to CO2 as carbon dioxide yet use the name tin for oxide to describe SNO2? This last page talks about naming and writing formulas. So I want you to go back to any of the worksheets that we've done, any of the notes that we've left empty, and that's, we're gonna go with all of our rules and knowing how to name, okay? All right, so hopefully this video was helpful. You have a nice big answer key to the Unit 6 worksheet, and hopefully you'll get some more studying and review in with the Kahoot and other practice questions.